God damn it. All right, I'd like to welcome everybody to the College of Complexes tonight. Again, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the College of Complexes tonight. My name is Tim. I'm going to be hosting this uh, reading tonight. Tonight we have Bob Lichtenberg uh, doing his philosophy tonight. Uh, the college consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief uh, announcements period. Then we'll have our speaker who will then speak for up to uh, you know an hour or so. Then there'll be questions and answers. After the questions and answers, we'll then have the uh, uh, infamous rebuttal period. We'll be finishing up here about 7.45 because the restaurant closes at 8. I'd like to welcome everybody now out to the college. All right, Charlie, come on up. We'll uh, get the announcement started. Well, hello, who we got on board here tonight? All right, um, I won't go through the full schedule, but we, um, and although I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our next week's program. Dr. Mike Trouss of the Center for Pluralism will be here giving us an analysis of the Palestine Israeli situation. So that's Dr. Mike Trouss. Now, the next open dates are May, May 11, 18, and 25. And one or two people have expressed interest in speaking. As always, I need a written title and a brief description of your presentation before we can book. Um, so we need to do that. We're also looking for May 4th, a special May Day program, someone to talk or representing the organized labor movement in the United States. So those are the next upcoming dates. And have you introduced Dr. Lichtenberg yet? Jim? Not yet. Um, I was just letting you know that uh, the schedule was going through. We got March 9th, the uh, Civic Self-Defense class, exercising a right to reject Reaganites of both parties. March 16th is the Libertarian Party in the primary election. After that, is a, on March 23rd, is a dark Libertarian mean stash, a collection of illustrations posted on social media. March 30th, we got Humanize Long term care campaign, dignity, community, and freedom for people with senior, with disabilities and seniors. And uh, in the following month in um, April, we got April 6th, a list of specific things you can do to save the planet and what they are doing in other countries. April 13th, Zillennials of Illinois, which is- um, Zennials. Zennials in Illinois. I thought, I thought that was a little something. On April 20th, we got the agenda for the Illinois Green Party. And on April 27th, why Joe Biden is the worst president our country has had since Jimmy Carter, and why America needs a Republican, any Republicans, to be our next president. All right. Ooh. If you're ready, uh, introduce Bob Lichtenberg, and we'll okay, get started. I'd like to welcome again a uh, longtime college regular to an attendee and speaker to the college complex, Dr. Robert Lichtenberg. Um, Oh, Dr. Philosophy instructor, and we'll be talking about Don Quixote moral messages uh, that is contained in that piece of literature. So, Dr. Bob, welcome to the college. Thank you. Okay, Bob. All right, Bob, you're real. You're up. No, you're you're up, Bob. He's coming. All right. Andy, if you want to make it a brief announcement, go ahead while we wait for Bob. Go ahead and make a brief announcement while we wait for Bob. Bob is on his way up to the podium. Uh, we're going to hear a talk on philosophy tonight. So uh, all of you stay tuned on Zoom out there. Welcome to the College of Complex. Let's Here's welcome Bob. Bob Lichtenberg. Okay, Bob. All right. Now you're going to have to use the microphone. I'll, I'll strap it up for you, but keep it right next to you. 
I'll leave it here. Now I'm going to strap it up because I've been very useless. Oh, that's what it's all about. All right, everyone. Thanks for that. Thanks for Tuesday for coming tonight. Such a snowy day. <laughs> I appreciate you coming out and taking the time. I know what it means to take time. It's not easy to do. Uh, I gave you all, does everyone have a handout of my talk? Uh, no? All right, just a moment, please. The reason I give these handouts is just so that people have something concrete to take away from my talk, namely most of my talk. <laughs> Usually when I go to a talk, I remember a speaker's two or three main points. That's about it. But if he gives me a hand up, I can file it and go back to it later. Um, okay. I, I started doing um, analysis of classic novels like Don Quixote at the Senior Center at Portage Park not too far from here, and um, they told me I couldn't do it. They said I had to wait months for approval from the city. I have to go an underground background check. And since I deal drugs on the side, I didn't want to do that. Just kidding. I don't deal drugs on the side. <laughs> uh, yeah. But... I decided to do it here at the college. And one more. And, and um, I'll make a study of all the classic novels. And I think I can get a book out of it. It'll be my 10th book. First, first one that's not on making meaning, though. The other nine books are on making meaning. Um, if you'd like to buy a book, I'd be glad to sell you one. Uh, let's see, what else? Anything else? Oh, um, I don't know, that's it. I'm going to um, revive the seekers who met for 24 years at various restaurants throughout Chicago and the uh, in my house toward the end. We're going to meet again in my house. And uh, <clears throat> I think the second day of the week, twice a month, I think. Twice a month would be good. I'm not sure which day. I don't think it'll be a Friday like it used to be. Like I said, it did, did go for 24 years till COVID killed it. Halfway through COVID killed it. Everyone was didn't want to come out anymore. But um, hopefully we can revive the seekers. The start of 25th year. But it's hard. It's pretty hard. We're all old now. <laughs> We're too old to get around. Um, that's not All right. Um, the story of Don Quixote, I think, is pretty well known by most people. And I'm not really going to go into a long detailed summary. It's a very long book, four volumes, written in two periods, 1605 and I think 1615 by Miguel Cervantes in uh, <clears throat> Spain. And um, it's a story about a man, Don Quixote. It was an upper class man, but he's now getting old. And um, he uh, decides, and I'll get into this a little more deeper in a little, in a little while. He decides he wants to be a knight. You know, one of these old fashioned knights with a sword on a horse and um, live, a, live a good life that way. 
to enlist the poor servant, Sancho Panza. And I hope we have some illustration. I wish Tim. I don't think he had one though. Sancho Panza was a servant of Don Quixote. Sancho Panza was a materialist, a realist. But Don Quixote had become a uh, an idealist. And when he became a knight, he wanted to live for an ideal. And that's his first message. I decided to title this talk, um, Life Lessons in Don Quixote. That's what I like to look at in these books, like Don Quixote. Uh, life Lessons. <clears throat> okay, the first life lesson I think that Don Quixote teaches, the first and most important one, his main message, is that we should live with passion. Have something you believe in that you're passionate about. It has to be something good. That's not the issue, though. That would be very hard to define, of course. But just find something you care deeply about. Care for something. Care for something strongly. Stand for something. Um, and that's what Don Quixote does when he lives as a knight. And we could do this, too. That's why it's a lesson to us. We could do this too. How can we do this? Well, it's not easy, of course. It's not easy for anyone um, to go against an entire society who doesn't appreciate such things <clears throat> as passion and a good life. Here's about other things. I'll get into that. But um, we could live with passion by living, living deeply and fully. That's how I do it. I try and live deep, as deep as I could go into life and its ideas. And I like to try to live fully and explore every area of life, every major good area of life, all, all the studies, everything. Explore everything, all the art forms. Know a lot about science, too. Fully and deeply, that's one way we could live with passion because then you really care about life and things in it. You could dedicate yourself to social work, to work to help improve society. I'll get into that later too. You could be your own self and not the self that society tells you to be, which is not very good really. <laughs> and, and that's another point I'll talk about later. But, uh, does anyone have any other way, anything that you're passionate about? Anyone have anything? This, and this would be best if it was uh, interactive. And, and, and if we uh, share ideas or if anything I say is confusing, please ask me to clarify it. And does anyone have uh, anything they care about passionately or know something passionate to live for other than what I've said, you know, living for uh, being yes. fully and deeply, doing social work, being your own self help. Um, yeah. yeah, I think we have to be like saints. Saints? Saints. Yeah, it has a religious overtone. Well, to, to take on the evil, we see the fascists and the evil saints over. And we feel powerless. It's good to, you know, just to be. Prevailing. Really? Yeah. Well, if you're powerless, how's prevailing going to do anything? And we are powerless. We have to pretty much. Very much. <laughs> we just, you know, do the next right thing. Be, do, you know, be courageous or trust. That's good, but I don't see how it gets anyone anywhere. Well, it's that, 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 that idea of passion, you know. Yeah, you, you do have passion. That's very good. That's good. Yeah. It's passionate. I don't know about the results it will achieve. I am passionate about uh, I am passionate about saving the earth. And most people in the world are passionate about convenience that is killing the earth. You get images of Don Quixote? Uh, not of Don uh, I don't think I got one of Don Quixote. Yeah. Caring about the earth, being passionate about that is much needed, and that's one of the absolutes I'll mention later, talk a little bit about. I'll have Anyone to... else? 
Yeah, yeah two good ones, two good responses. It was a very hard question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Chris. I'm about saving our democracy. How about thorium molten salt reactors that'll save the planet? I'm passionate about that and this college of complexes. Self reactors. What about the college oh, of complexes? I'm passionate about that too. Yeah. Yeah, you and Charlie have been that best one. And we all appreciate it very much. You keep it going for so many years I'm on a good level when there's so many bad things happening in recent years. You know, it was when falling apart, there's scams everywhere you go. I get scammed for practically everything. They're trying to scam me, that's for sure. So yeah, keeping the college going is something you can be passionate about. So we have two people there. That's a good sex one. You find a picture of Don Cody yet? I don't think I have him, but we'll get one real quick. It could be a bunch of him, him, and the windmill, if we can get the windmill. Okay, let's move on. Time for my boot hills to be wandering. Who said that? Who wrote that? My, time, my boot hills to be wandering. Time for doing yeah. that. I'll give you a hint. He, wrote, he won a Nobel Prize. For, not for that, but for that kind of thing. No, it's not our kind of music. That was Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, hey, Mr. Tangerine Man. It's time for my boot heels to be wandering. That's a good expression. Instead of saying, well, I got to go now. <laughs> and it's a kind of aimless thing. He's just wandering around. You know, he doesn't really have a purpose that he's trying to achieve or any goal. He knows I am. He's just wandering, wandering through life, trying to figure it out. <clears throat> he deserves Nobel Prizes for lines like that. Definitely much better than the other writers. Okay. Let's wander aimlessly. <laughs> no, no, I hope not aimlessly. Um, okay, but when Don Quixote tries to live his life as a knight, he finds out that he's not really living in reality. He's living in an ideal world. The night world is dead. That was in the Middle Ages. He had a bunch of rich men on horses with swords, saving people, helping people, especially women, fighting dragons and stuff like that. But that world was over. There was a new world. Uh, rebirth of knowledge. And uh, Don Quixote wasn't a part of that. He was part of the old world. He didn't perceive the way things are. He couldn't see them couldn't realize how things are. And she's this hooker and calls her Dulcinea and gives her food because he thinks she's a princess. To him, she looks like a princess. That's very mistaken. By the way, some of you, I'm sure some of you have heard of the uh, song, um, you know, the album uh, and play uh, Man of La Mancha. Man of La Mancha is based much on uh, uh, Don Quixote. It was well, based entirely on Don Quixote. And um, uh, there's one song to Dulcinea in there that, that I remember very well. <clears throat> um, so he's living in a, a world that's not reality. He's um, trying to get a better world, an ideal world of knighthood. But um, if um, <clears throat> if you do this, well, then you're, you're committing your life to something. Aren't, isn't that better than being less of a person like the realistic Sancho Panza? Did you get it yet? Yeah, it's been up for a There's while. There's the windmill. And there's Don Quixote. Okay, I'll, I'll get to the windmill later. Could you get one of Don Quixote and Sancho Panza? Yes. I'll, I'll get the so, um, Peyote holds it. Uh, I lost my place here. 
he only holds that a person's life must must make a big difference. We all make a little difference. We should revolt blindly against our society and the material world. And this is a way we could become a leader. Um, we're conditioned by our society brutally to be a capitalist and a materialist and to be a mere consumer. That's all we're trained to be in school through college. Maybe not graduate school, <laughs> but uh, we're just slowly consumers. That's all we learn in our society. Make a lot of money and buy a lot of things, and then you're a winner. And that's who we worship as our ideal. But we got to do more than that, says Keone. You must carefully think of some passionate good life. Okay. Move on to the second life lesson, Don Kelly, is that all of us must find a, a way of life that is appropriate to our age. Okay, we gotta live appropriately to our age. When you're young, you have to decide whether you go to school or work. When you stop school, when you start working. Middle age, there's a crisis. Is my work fulfilling? Am I accomplishing anything worthwhile? Then there's old age. And Don Quixote was entering this, although he was only 51, according to the book. Um, if you got that old in those days, 1605, then you were considered old. So Don Quixote's getting old and he's wondering what to do with the rest of his life. Now he's not working. So he becomes, he decides that he should do more than just read about nights. He should become a knight. He should live on a knight. He gets his old workhorse. You have a picture of that? Uh, yeah, I no. had it. I had up Don wait, Quixote. Wait, you, you didn't get to it. I got it up when I took it down already. Oh, well, I didn't know that. Well, well, Sancho Panza. Yeah, I'll get to Sancho Panza. Oh, wait. Where am I now? Um, back up. Okay, Bob, hang on. He's going back up. Sancho Panza and uh, Don Quixote are back up. There, there you are up. Okay. The knight is Don Quixote on his horse. That's a noble picture of him. His horse is an old work horse broken down. Can you hear me okay? You need to be near the mic. And then I can see the um, <laughs> images. And that's Sancho Panza on his right. Uh, uh, well, it'll be his left, but all right. Um, Okay, what was I looking for? Um, you wanted a windmill? Yeah, I would put the windmill on. Next, with okay. Kiyoti. So, Dan Kiyoti gets on his old broken down workhorse. And he tries to destroy evil wherever he can and to help others in distress, especially women who had a much lower status back then. He's usually rescuing women. Um, <clears throat> he believes in old age you should have honor most of all not money not a lot of money like our capitalist society teaches us only to do um, <clears throat> um, having honor for example Many of you probably realize you could lie and get away with it so the other person can't check you out. They can't check on what you're saying. They're too busy for that. They could lie with a lot of things and get away with it. But it's the honorable thing to tell the truth, the OD holds. Um, although I treat that in uh, absolutes a little bit more. 
Hem de can iyi So honor is the main thing in old age for Coyote. That's what he teaches us. We have honor in helping people in distress and we have them around us everywhere we go. We have, for example, people living in vi under viaducts. Every, almost every viaduct that they can get under, you see people hundred huddled in tents and they're homeless people, migrants. And um, there's plenty of opportunities for us to help people in distress today. There were many more in Coyote's time. Um, men could rape women and get away with it, usually back then. And they still can <laughs> some place, some, some country. I'll talk about that. That's next. Uh, third point on page two. Everyone have page two. I didn't number page two. But number three at the top says everything's not relative or dependent on each person. Um, okay, he did, he, he already did believe in, um, he, he was, um, justified in attacking windmills, you see, you see the image there, and, uh, windmills, he thought were dragons, you know, but, um, they could be symbols for corrupt rulers hovering over us. It's very symbolic. There's many levels. This is excellent writing. Writing is best. That can mean so much. So many things, so many good things. Cervantes has given us in Don Quixote, I think. But Quixote is deluded. Um, and he attacks windmills. And he thinks they're giants. But then he starts to see a need for to have bigger truth, more sustaining and imaginative truth. Um, and that is tragic. He dies tragically. Don Kilty dies tragically. He dies. What I mean by tragically is unredeemed. His death is unredeemed. He does not die a worthwhile death because all he could find is relative belief. And um, I got some examples of relativism that I want to pass around. If you can read the bottom of this page, in the bottom part, you see what things society has embraced, different societies embrace different things as they think what's good depends on what they think is good. And, uh, they, and everything is embraced, even killing, murder, um, eating other people's brains, <laughs> and stuff like that They're at the bottom of this page here, I'll pass around. But I want these back. At the bottom of this. Many amusing examples. I used to give that to my students. I taught philosophy for 40 years in five states. And I had a lot of fun. I learned a lot. One of the things I learned is relativism does lead to a lot of ridiculous uh, beliefs like are on those handouts that I'm now circulating. And Coyote realizes the same thing. He dies and he says, well, I really just hurt people. And I, um, I was wrong. I was all wrong. Two things he says when he dies. So that leads into the next point. Four. Coyote's death instructs us all that we need to, we need absolutes or universal ideas to guide our life. Absolutes. 
um, have no exceptions. There are always two. They hold two for all people. Um, my first talk, I think, at the college was in 1979, I believe. It was in 79. I talked about absolutes. That, uh, and Sid Cohen, who's here tonight, was there. And he disagreed with me on absolutes. I don't think there's any absolutes except King. But um, you got to read to Franklin. No, I'm it. Tim? Yeah, I'm going to pull okay. it up. Uh, absolutes tell us what we ought to do. That's the main point. And that gets us into a separate realm of existence that uh, um, a materialist would never accept. But if you want this matter, you could have it. There's not much to it. There's got to be more than that. I can't go into that tonight. It's a very complex question. Uh, is there more than matter? Is more, does more than matter exist? Is there a realm of what we ought to do? Does that really exist? I say it does. I can't, I can't go into that. I'm sorry. That's way too long. That's the basic question of metaphysics. Um, <clears throat> So they tell us, absolutely tell us what we ought to do, not what we do do. Get it? Anyone gets it? Nobody got it. He, he got it. Doo <laughs> uh, <laughs> doo. You know what doo doo is? <laughs> All right. Pardon me? Oh, I got a lot of them. I got, uh, that's what I'm talking about next. Um, maybe not a lot, but. I'll try and get some more, ad lib some more into there. Um, but examples of absolutes are the following. And these are not in Don Quixote. Most of these are not in Don Quixote. But Don Quixote realized a great need because he wasted his life. He led his life wrongly. We don't want to do that, do we? But society couldn't lead him into a search for anything higher than that. So we need something more to lead a good life. And that's absolute. Some examples that are following. As Aretha Franklin says, Sock it to me, baby. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. I mean, that song. Yeah, what the hell Why does she spell it out, do you think? R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Why does she spell it? To indicate why it's so important. It's a spell, so she makes sure you get it. And that's uh, <clears throat> an absolute. They have three people will respect all the time. The respect that they earn. They could forfeit their respect, you know, by act acting unethically, by murdering and things like that. David, he's trying to give you something. You could forfeit your respect, but... Uh, um, if you don't, you know, if you don't murder anyone and do something like that, um, you should get lots of respect. Everyone deserves a lot of respect, everybody, unless they forfeit it in some ways. And most people do not do that. All right, freedom is another absolute. So every person is entitled to all the freedom that's compatible with the freedom of other people. That's important idea. Three, doing good. Every person ought to do as much good as they can for others, mostly, is what that means, called beneficence by philosophers. That's a tongue for them. Well, you should not burn yourself out. Or overdo it or hurt yourself, but do as much good as you can without hurting yourself in the process. Said Immanuel Kant, a great philosopher in the modern ages, he didn't have a picture of Kant, did you tell him? Uh, Tim? The, uh, picture of Kant? The artist? No. K A N T. You didn't tell you me to probably get him. Get one. K -A -N -T. But it's not important, it's not important. He was just a great thinker on the absolute. It was extremely hard to read. He didn't want to be misunderstood, but now hardly anyone can understand him. 
Um, four. Four to absolute is peace. Limit violence. Except the self-defense of an innocent life and any big theft of property. I think violence could be justified. All right, ecology, I said I'd mention this. This is a newer absolute, one we discovered in the last few generations. Ecology, and now expressed as preserve the uh, harmony, the most beautiful harmony of the things in this world. It used to be preserve the balance, but I like harmony better. It has more dimensions to it. It's got melodies and harmonies interweaving. And that's what the earth is like. Um, so we have to achieve a beautiful harmony of all the world's main, main parts, like humans, animals, plants, water, and air are the main parts of the world. And we have to balance those out. If you don't, say you pollute the air, pollute the air, water, you're asking for big trouble. You know, if you break that absolute. Um, <clears throat> seven, knowledge. We all have an obligation because we're rational beings. That's how we distinguish from the other animals. For an Aristotle, um, <clears throat> he classified humans as animals, but how do they differ from the other animals? What's the specific difference he always looked for in his definitions? What you should always do when you're dealing with any ambiguous or vague term, define it right away so everyone knows what you're talking about. That's what Aristotle did for every single species. <laughs> he got real trivial, but he came to humans eventually. And he said the way humans differ from other animals, what's distinct about them, <clears throat> humans is that they're rational, they're intelligent. They could use ideas to some extent, much more than any animal. Oh, some animals we learn you can't think a little. Uh, Aristotle certainly didn't know that. But our capacity to reason is very limited. Like, for example, I went to the store to buy a loaf of bread last Tuesday. And I got about six ideas in my mind right now. And they're real simple, stupid ideas. <laughs> um, I can't get any more than that, though. Go ahead. Well, I, uh, I took the picture down. You need another one up? Um, let's see. No. I guess we're done with those. Okay, I got more when you're ready. So just. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we need to know deep truths. That's, a, that's an absolute requirement. That's what we ought to do. Now, it's not what we do do. It's not do do. <laughs> it's what we ought to do, just like all these absolutes are. And then there's a famous, kind of famous golden rule. Maybe I have an image of that. I do. Can't call it the categorical imperative, confusing everyone <laughs> again. But maybe you've heard of that. That's just another name for the golden rule. And the golden rule is found in all the world religions. Like, um, I'm getting it up now. Uh, I mean, religions that are um, offered to all people. Some religions that are only for people of a certain country or, or race or nationality. But all the world's religions, like Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and <clears throat> Confucianism, Taoism. They all have the golden rule, and then you find there's some version of it in all the world religions. That's what they call them, world religions. I don't know why they call them that. But the golden rule is to treat others as you want to be treated. Treat others as you want to be treated. Um, always treat others the way you would like to be treated yourself. Um, which is very good, I think. But and some philosophers have made it even better by specifying how do you want to be <clears throat> treated. And uh, they specify these good philosophers. I don't know if Aristotle did this. Kant certainly did. 
but um, treat others only as an end in yourself, only as an end worthy of respect. You want to be treated that way. You do not want people to use you as a means to use you to get something. To, you know, <clears throat> you get things for um, uh, yourself. Although that has to be done sometimes, nobody should regard you as a means to their end. <clears throat> Number nine, honesty is tell the truth. Keep your promises. Keep your word. Your word is very important. Or it should be. Some people's words mean nothing that I've dealt with. They change it. Like my son does that. <laughs> he changes. Mm, it's an absolute. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the eighth one. No, it's the ninth one. <clears throat> Tell the truth, honesty. Keep your word. Keep your promises. Your word is very important. But you could tell a lie if it does a greater good, and obviously greater good. Let's see, um, I have a hard time thinking of an example that right now. Sorry. <clears throat> Pardon me. Like Iraq has uranium, false the Uranium. Oh, it's a lot. It's a lot, but it's and it was it was framed as that's why we spent five trillion dollars on all the oil. The so wow. why that uh, because the, 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 war, the yeah. international yeah. war on terror that caused five trillion dollars in ten years because we said Saddam because we said that we need some water, Bob. Yeah, we created these guys. Uh, you, know, uh, of water? you give me a glass of water. Yeah. I was thinking of more personal, <laughs> personal things. Water. Yeah, lying to another person just not to hurt her feelings. Yeah. Um, when the lie won't do any harm. Uh, I can't think of anything more concrete than that. Sorry, that's too late. <laughs> too late at night for that. No, not really, but I'm just failing here. Sorry. Um, all right, the fifth and final, thank you, life lesson of Coyote is that you, you have to have a high moral code, like Don Coyote did when he was a knight. It was called chivalry. I'm sure some of you have heard of that. Yeah. I know Charlie has. <laughs> chivalry. And Coyote's code was to, we ought to, to be caring about others in distress, <coughs> courageous, brave, carried out, and helpful toward the weak and the oppressed. But is this code too low, too high? It's very high code. What virtues are good personal traits? I defined it right away there. You can notice that. Um, there's at least 52 main virtues good personal traits that can go into the code, <clears throat> moral code, or code of ethics. Some of these include love, kindness, friendliness, compassion, selflessness, self-control, humility, and empathy, and persistence, and honesty. Any others? Any others you think should be part of your moral code, your don't, ethical code, or anyone? Who? Don't steal. That's don't kind of negative. Wrong. Respect property. I don't know, would you make that high though? Not today. There's too many police around, too many people around, you know, to make it easy to steal much. And any other, any other virtues you think are important in your own life for you to be? That's what the COD is asking us by giving it his code, even though it was a failure. You know, he's asking us to make our own and think about important questions like this that matter most. I would add honor. Honor. 
You would add on there. What do I want to add? Nothing. I'm done. You're done? Finished. Okay. Any questions? Thank you for your attention. All right. Well, I'll uh, take questions now from Bob. Well, let's thank Bob for speaking. Okay. Well, come on. Uh, Ellen, come on up. Um, yeah, so we can hear, you know, it's, it's all right. Yeah. I uh, just take the, I'll grab the mic from the thing. Oh, you got it, you got it. Just, Janice, go ahead with your question. Janice, go ahead with your question and we'll answer it. Uh, thank you. Um, okay. Okay, I think I got rid of the uh, muting. Um, yeah, my <laughs> excuse me, my question is, um, what can we do uh, to save both democracy and the earth from convenience that everybody, you know, we, we, we follow, uh, uh, um, corporations what they tell us to do how can we follow our own passion so you're saying how can we follow our own passions yeah, yeah. instead of those that are advertised to us no one said it would be easy Coyote never said it'd be easy it's awful hard that's a key question um it's extremely hard to find to follow your own passion when society is against that kind of thing they want conformity they want sameness um the point i forgot to mention in my um the point i forgot to mention in my talk was that our society is rather stupid because it doesn't care about the truly important things. It compares about money, cake, and it values money and things. And that's about it. Because it's stupid and try and find higher things. You know, let Coyote down, let's all of us down. All right, go ahead, John. Yeah, uh, thanks, Bob. Um, I wanted, uh, you know, Janet's question gave me a. Uh, an idea too that one about Carl Rogers saying that we need to have a an internal locus of control versus an external locus of control. You know this in order to deal with existential times. You know I think often managers are trying to manipulate you. You know and they don't have that. They don't have respect. You know so. Um, so kind of related to that is, why did Don Quixote feel, and I don't know if you feel this way, uh, that his life was not worthwhile in the end, you know? And I, was that, did Cervantes feel that way? And uh, I also, if, if, and just to finish that thought is lately, I've been, I was at a funeral today and I read a book called, this concept called morphology. As we're getting closer to death, we, you know, I think this idea of making meaning, as you've talked about before, right, making meaning of our life becomes more important. And, and I think, you know, that's like my idea of being like a saint or, uh, you know, trying to make kind of a legacy, you know, um, I think some people like leave, I want to, you know, fix up this church or, you know, where to leave our things. Uh, you know, with the pandemic, it's like, I don't even have a will, but, but you start to think about this stuff more in life. So um, anyhow, how do you feel that way? And why did Cervantes feel that way? Because he read, he wrote this great book, right? So um, anyhow. I think he was just raising some good questions. I don't think they pertain to his own life because he was a successful novelist, the first one. And, and so he wasn't plagued with this problem. But you could see a lot of people are, that they have no passions, nothing they really care much about. <clears throat> and so I think he, he gave that the first, first main point of Don Quixote. So he, he felt like he did not, wasn't redeemed. How do you define that? You, you don't have a, 
a good life or a good death? Why, I mean, how does that mean to you? You know, I mean, you know, what does that mean? I don't know. Oh, well, what I meant by Coyote's unredeemed death is that he died for no purpose. He stood for nothing. He was all wrong. He couldn't justify his life. And he tried very hard to be a knight, and it just didn't work because he didn't have enough from his society, enough support. And um, he, he would have gone to hell if there was such a thing because he did a lot of harm. He admits, he says that. He hurt a lot of people, and he was wrong. And that's why his death is unredeemed. There was no redemption for Okay, Kiyoshi. let's move on, Alan. Died. Okay, who's got the next question? Oh, you want to come up? Yeah. Can you come up? Um, Just bring, bring the mic over so we can hear him on the computer. All right, here's to the, pro the philosophy professor. Is Okay, here's the, the question. Is it better to be a happy pig or a sad Socrates? <laughs> Is it better to be a happy pig or a sad Socrates? I'd take the sad Socrates any day. Really? Yeah, because the Socrates could inquire and overcome his sadness if he just wants to, if his will is strong enough. A pig can never do that. Uh, and a pig is he has very little awareness of his happiness anyway. And it's a superficial happiness. The happiness that comes from things, that's not much happiness. You know, it's, um, a big pig is happy. Yeah, because he's satisfied with Okay. <laughs> Let's move on to Kelvin. Go ahead, Kelvin. Yeah, my question is, um, have you read uh, Graham Greene's pastiche on Don Quixote, uh, Monsignor Quixote at all? It has uh, kind of slight, slight overtones of the ecology complexes to a degree, when it has, it has uh, Monsignor Quixote is um, a, a humble priest that's elevated to, a, to Monsignorship, and his San, Sancho Panza character is a communist atheist who he, who he travels around Spain, Spain with uh, in post-Franco society. Um, I don't know, I'll, leave, I'll, put, I'll put a little note of it in the chat there, uh, Monsignor Kyoto. So if you, if you look it up on, on, on Wikipedia, uh, Green was um, a, a, a very big fan of uh, Cervantes. Um, he, he tells the story of a there was a, a particular Napoleonic general that was asked by Napoleon, Napoleon could he speak Spanish? And the general said, unfortunately not, the emperor. And he says, oh, that's a pity. And the general thinking he must have a, a, a position for him that's very important in Spain. So he went, went away, got Spanish cheats, and he learned how to, to, to speak Spanish. And then about three months, after three months, he learned how to speak Spanish. He went to, the, to, to Napoleon and says, I can now speak Spanish. He says, oh, that's great. You'll be able to read Cervantes in its original end. <laughs> Which uh, Green, 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 Green says it was worth it. Um, anyway, uh, my question is, have you read uh, Green's uh, Monsignor Quixote? How do you rate Monsignor Quixote? How do I rank him? Rankin, Rankin. No, if you read Greg Green's one, you see the Quixote. Would you say that one more time, Calvin? Have you read Graham's Green pastiche of, uh, of the book, Monsignor Quixote? He's asking if you've read Monsignor Quixote. Well, that's the whole thing, no. It's four long books. No, no, uh, it's it's, it's a great green pastiche. It's a very smart short novel. I'll put a link there on on on, on the chat. Okay. okay. He's going to put a link on the chat. Okay. All right. Did Who, you have a question, Charlie? Yeah. All right, Bob. I'm a little suspect. Anybody who boasts a binary dichotomy, yin yang type of approach to all of human existence. In human conduct, 
you can give just as much a fulfilling life committing pure acts of evil and wow. vengeance. Yes, you can. You can okay, drive right Trump. just as much meaning as you can by doing acts of kindness and so forth. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Look at Vladimir Putin. Yes. So where do you where do you, you don't even mention that at all? One has a choice, and the choice is we had the speaker here on the, the Church of Satan. Yeah. Yes. Like you can day. choose a life of evil <laughs> can give you very you can have a very nice life committing acts of misconduct. Like Bush and Cheney. Yeah, like all, Bush and Cheney uh, Machiavelli, right? Yeah. What's wrong with being evil? Right? Yeah. 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 That's just the thing nuts to me. How could you have a fulfilling life of evil? You You've got to be dead wrong about that. Anyone who does that is dead wrong. <laughs> They're good. They said they're really twisted. They're happy that they hurt others. That's cuckoo. Right. I mean, there's something wrong upstairs. Why? Because they're hurting others. They said, oh, come on now, shrug. So that, that's inflicting pain needlessly. That's a horrible wrong. And shrug your shoulders at everything. No. They have a life of power. Power, yeah, but it's misused. Totally misused. Yeah. Yeah. Life is not about power. That's what Nietzsche held. Nietzsche held, go for the power. And look what happened to that. You know, ended up with the Nazis. You know, they weren't for power. You know, and that's a logical outcome. There's an awful lot of human conflict. Roman century Christians committed to acts of pure evil. True. And you're telling me it's going to be avoided? Yes, damn right. Well, oh, you, well, you, well, you, well, you. Obviously, they're committing it. Do you believe in being evil too? Uh, well, it's, try it. he's got some wholesale belief system of the universe that's a binary universe. I don't know where that came from. There's no such thing in science that there's a two opposing forces anywhere in the universe. Yet, do you think there's a good and evil? I don't okay. understand you why. Are he -oh all right, all right. Let's yeah, you, let, you got it. You want to say I'm something? Just gonna say it. Wait, okay, yeah. I'd like to get it. About the binary thing, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And you can try and find a balance between what's really good, even though it may you may lose something, and what's really evil, even though you gain. Yes, but it runs at body and breath stays at rest. Do you agree that it's okay no, to be evil? I, I totally disagree with the idea that it's evil by going for evil. It happens a lot, no doubt about that. Yeah. But I, I totally disagree with the right way to get the people okay with it. We're going to keep going out. Who are, who are you to decide? People might decide. Who are you to decide? I think what we're talking about yeah. is if you're saying, for me, doing this is okay, you're right. I can't disagree with you on that. But if I'm saying that's better for everybody, that's the problem. There is no mechanism for assessing human conduct one way or another. And that's what he's talking about. Sure, sure. Are there absolutes at all? Are there absolutes that are worth it itself? Yes, so we've got like figuring it to do this. But are there absolutes that are worth it? He's a philosopher, right? Yeah, all right. Charlie, and are you talking more. about peyote or bot? What? Are you talking about peyote or bot? Peyote what? Well, he's talking, he's talking about me. So you know, my view is so thank you. Charlie, as I so you're saying yeah. that Charlie, that an entrepreneur has a good life, right? He's imposing his own. Oh, kind of. Uh, 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 you want know, anyone to talk about anything then? Is that what we should do? Presenting a perspective. Whether yeah. or not you agree, that's I don't think the universe says a neutrality to the universe. There's a lot of that, certainly, but there's good too. And you know, there's a way of finding good. It's called logic. There are absolute rules for thinking, for good, bad, good and bad thinking. Logic, yeah, back to Aristotle. He developed the fourth century, and it's, it gives us their true in all postures at all times. There's no good or evil if you use logic. Any kid who wants to spoil your life, if you start opposing good and evil, you are no longer using logic. I'm buying Charlie's argument. Oh, logic applies to good and evil. Absolutely not. Yes, it does. Absolutely That's does. a value judgment. No, it is. What are you doing? You're doing that. You, you transcending that? You're, you're opposing some pure world of emotions. No. 
But that's not even objective. So Dr. Spock is okay because the motion is written out. He is not Dr. Spock. What about go ahead, Ellen? Yeah, my theory is that uh, Charlie was saying before that that there's no inductive. He he's like he thinks the world is like TV and deductively, you know, he watches TV and that's how you know that Kennedy was only shot by one person. It, it's interesting in terms of logic. A lot of people think wrongly that just deductively, and they don't look at the world inductively, you know. And but also, and one thing that that Jim Fetzer pointed out as a philosopher is you need to look at it adductively. That the way the world is is not necessarily just your logical train of thought about it, you know. I mean, it, it's. I, but you have to have an open mind, as Andy says, and like an eighth grade education and an open mind. No, no, and I think, I think your no. mind is fundamentally closed. And you just like arguing like a contrarian or something. But anyhow, Andy had a question. Andy, here's your question. Yeah, the question I have, Bob, uh, after all, you know, learning, uh, listening to, you know, philosophical, uh, what we should be doing. I want you to know, um, I want you to tell us what you think are the three biggest problems facing humanity that we should work on now. That if we don't tackle those three, then humanity has no future. What are the top two? Just name the top two things you think that uh, we don't have any future if we don't address them. I don't really deal with that too much. I'll tell you one right away, though, is ecology, a balance, the harmony then of nature. If we don't do that, we're going as quickly, you know, which we might be, but it's climate change. Well, that benefits Chicago. <laughs> it's a murder on the coast. So uh, another big social problem is, um, anyone have a suggestion? War. War? war? Yeah, wars. We got passes for conflicting wars in Ukraine, in the Middle East. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, they, they that's enough. Have enough. Nuclear, <laughs> nuclear, the threat of nuclear annihilation. Yeah, but we contained that since World War II. No, we, any ruler knows how horrible it is, and no one would think of doing it. Do you really think the madman theory of Kissinger, who was trained by Reinhard Gellin, the head of our CIA and BND, I don't think the madman theory really, really is a going to work it's, though it does seem so far they haven't blown us up but they have poisoned us with biological warfare our air our water our vaccine who did that corporations or no, reinhard gellin this was a plan by the nazis the leave behind army with the cia oh, the BND, to to yeah the strategy of tension operation gladio um, what to left with to NATO. With... Well, I'm just saying that that's one thing. If we don't deal with it, I, maybe it's too late to deal with it, really. Uh, but Andy's question that's, I don't I think a... nuclear annihilation has been dealt with. That's, I oh, I think it's dealt with itself. I put war as the second. That was a good suggestion. Okay, okay. All right, Bob. Bob, Charlie, Bob, 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 Charlie was making some points here. Which I thought were pretty good. Okay, is Charlie pointing his finger at you, or is he pointing pointing his finger at Cervantes? So you are you're 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 in you're you're agreeing with Cervantes and Quixote. Oh yeah. You're you're in their camp. Okay now. And so this binary. This, this binary thing is. Get the microphone up. Yeah. I got to see. You go up there if you want to go. Yeah, you go up there if you want to go up up for a minute or two. You can chat with it for about a couple minutes. I'm going to grab it. I thought you were just a messenger. But you're more than a messenger. You're. And use the mic, you guys, so they can hear you. In, in, in. So you are the messenger. Give us the mic back. Well, then Charlie was. But you you wholeheartedly agree with Quixote and Cervantes. Yeah, yeah those are great, 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 great. Okay. 
All right. Here, I'll do it. There? Yeah. Keep it there. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I do. All right. Um, you know, they the law has often said that corporations are a person. Therefore, shouldn't the corporation have a philosophy too as well? Our corporations are not persons except in the metaphorical sense. They're not physically persons, obviously. Should they have a philosophy? Yes, every, every human organization should have a philosophy. Basic principles that guide them to um, what they ought to do and know. Have you seen the movie, The Corporation? It's a great documentary, a classic, which goes through and proves that if a corporation is a person, as was decided before Citizens United, they would be a psychopath because by definition, they don't have a conscience. You know, they're, and that's the problem with giving them the same rights as a person. Don't right? the same they problem needed to be, They need to be regulated, not not considered a person but and so that's why there's no limits on them they've given themselves absolute power um right yeah to just take over and um that's that's what i consider the problem with luciferian and the problem of of no restraints on on evil and selfish intent are very limited very very limited there's bylaws on what corporation can do and they're enforced usually. Not with elections. It, they really define themselves as a person before the Citizens United. And they um, that really is a problem that, because a, an institution has to be regulated and a, the laws were designed for people, not corporations. And I think that's been their dirty trick. Well, then would capitalism be considered a philosophy? Capitalism, capitalism. a philosophy? Yeah, it's a philosophy. I uh, know particularly good it is um, because it only looks for material things and a better one might be socialism, some form of socialism, but I can't specify what kind. Well, it is a philosophy, but I don't think it's very good. <laughs> I, I liked your idea, one of the absolutes of selflessness, I, because I've come to realize that actually what colors your parachute define me as a selfless person, but there was only one job and that would be a nursery school teacher. And it's, it's really hard to be, it, you feel like Don Quixote being a selfless person in a selfish world. And um, it, you know, that's why I say you have to almost be like a saint because uh, more and more people are like Charlie and uh, we're, it's kind of being indoctrinated that believe that that being absolute, and I was raised by an Ayn Rand family that believed in the virtue of selfishness. And, you know, conceptually, it sounds, you know, yeah, there's some value in it, but, but if it's, um, as a philosophy, it, it is, um, it is kind of Luciferian, like it's better to rule in hell than serve in heaven. It can lead toward. Summarize Ayn Rand's philosophy of selfishness. Yeah. Could you briefly summarize that for us, please? Yeah, Ayn Rand believed in the virtue of selfishness, right? And um, so did my stepfather. I think that he was trained that way uh, through, I don't know, Amherst or the German background. But she had, you know, as many people read the book, her books uh, about that okay. as the Bible. And, um, right. you know, and, and, right, and she's not the speaker tonight. We know that, but that we're in the truck. Well, Charlie, would you like to speak on the virtue of I'd selfishness? Like to ask a question. Okay. Question period. And turn over the microphone. You want a question? Please, speaker. Okay. I do have a question. Yeah, I, 10 minutes ago I did. Okay. Now, uh, yes, by the way, a knight carries a weapon. And he carries a weapon for a purpose, to inflict harm on other people. Now, according to you, who also do these platitudes of goody, 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 but why is he carrying a weapon? And what is the code of the knight? A knight is a soldier who goes into battle. 
and inflicts harm on the enemy of the community. And in many communities, those who are better at protecting the community or killing your enemy are given significant status and awards. Why the evil people, they fight rapists and abusers um, with the sword, true. But that was part of the Middle Ages. Well, that's going now. It what is. Are we, hmm? It what is. What happened when the Germans invade Russia? Yeah. What about Russia? They were. They said, "Go ahead and kill the German invader." <laughs> Who did? The Russian leaders. Oh. Kill a Russian invader, a German invader. Oh, did they? Yeah. Uh, well, that's a, a fact a again. Drive. So that's good. Well, well he's saying there's one system. There's one. Well, they're doing evil. We consider evil. But that's good evil. Right? <laughs> good evil. Yeah, just where did that come okay. from? Okay. Yeah. Who else has questions? Another contradiction. I'm doing good evil. Yeah, why did he give him the sword? Okay, who else has questions? Oh, I was playing to... dragon. Oh, I give him the mic. Give him the mic. We on. just need to do this because they need to help us. And Joseph will get you next. Uh, uh, I heard you advocating for uh, like following passions, and I wonder if there's a passion that you followed in life. Was there a passion that you followed in life? My passion, yeah, making me. I try to make meaning as much meaning as I can, mostly for others, mostly by writing books on how to make meaning, which everyone could read someday. And my goal is to try and reach as many people as I can. And I think I'm on the verge of doing that. You know, I got an agent who might give me a contract with a big publisher. Although Charlie doesn't think so much. But uh, well, I'm sorry, I lost the question. What well, was my passion? You said, you said your passion was making meaning, right? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that why we're here? To make as much meaning as we can? I think so. Yeah. Okay. So that's Joseph. my passion. I'm passionate about that. And I think it's a good thing. Okay, um, Joseph, unmute and ask your question. You got to unmute, Joseph. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you for highlighting all those virtues uh, that. People everywhere and at all times hold, uh, hold up as endearing. My first question is, did you say in between that one may lie for a greater goal? Uh, if so, is this from uh, Don Quixote or is it that I misheard? man here. Did you say that uh, one may lie for a greater goal? Oh, sure, that could happen. I said Jesus did it. That's a religious belief, though, not philosophical. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. You uh, yeah, I guess they could do it. I can't think of a particular example of, of one man dying for a greater good. <clears throat> I usually like to think of that in terms of why you're not dying. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, my second question. Oh, he had another question. My second question um, is kind of a reiteration of some other questions here. Um, as a practical matter, um, in contemporary aggressive capitalism, the heightened materialism, competition, and exploitation, etc., are in dichotomy with all the virtues you highlighted. Uh, one who holds up all these virtues um, close to his or her heart is likely to end up being a sad Socrates. Uh, what do you say to that? I'm not sure what the question is. I'm afraid I, 
didn't hear it actually. Is it, are we going to end up being a sad soccer team? Is that, I just heard the end. Um, yeah. What's the danger of the ending up a sad soccer team? Oh, we're not going to be a sad soccer team. Let me repeat. Let me let me repeat. I said someone who will follow all those virtues you highlighted uh, in this contemporary aggressive capitalism, uh, they are likely to end up being a sad Socrates. Yes, what do you say to that? You can say, so be it. Or some other solution. Sacrifice. David. David. Um, I don't think so. I don't think a person with virtue is going to end up in, as a sad Socrates in our society. Even though our society cares little about things. And like Don Quixote, you wouldn't fit in if you had virtues. If you emphasize virtues. If you care about them. Because most people don't care about that. They have no clue about that. Um, um, but you'd be happy in yourself. You'd be very happy in yourself. And uh, that should matter. And um, matter most. Um, so I think um, a virtuous person would be happy, even in a capitalist society. As crummy as that is. What? Uh, I believe it will be a very, very difficult exercise or art anyway thank you you're welcome okay you're anybody welcome. else have any questions all right now yes. we're going to go to the rebuttal period anybody who's got a rebuttal here you can stand up and uh get in front of the thing or anybody online um i'm going to give each of you about five or six minutes to uh, go on wow. and uh you know, because we've got a little time yet. we got about another hour or so. Uh, so if you want to rebut, now's the time to do so. Okay, I'll, I'll start. You'll go first. Yeah. And then we we'll wait till Bob goes up, get behind the podium. Okay. And uh, mm -hmm. let's... Uh, Five minutes, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we'll... Uh, thank you, Bob, for speaking tonight. Let's give Bob a hand. All right, now here's our infamous rebuttal period. Go ahead, Ellen. Right, well, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I'm Ellen Corley, and ever since I started coming here five or, I don't know how many years ago, uh, Don told me about it, Don and, um, and Doug Binkley, and he said, this is a forum where you can get up and talk, but not necessarily, you don't, you know, you don't have to rebut. You could just talk about what you agree with, which I, I do agree with Bob's, uh, what Bob has said. And um, my thoughts are that philosophy is important and we do need, uh, we need to be teaching it and um, schools. I got it in the Presbyterian church growing up it, from a young girl, but you know, um, I think I was there three years old or so. And, but my father, I was lucky to grow up in a community, a Presbyterian community where the preacher talked about it and the parents and grandparents modeled it. And um, in a way, it it kind of makes you kind of like an angel or a saint, you know, it, it's always been kind of funny to see a selfish world, you know. Um, I, I kind of have lived by those moral absolutes and took them seriously, uh, you know, all the I would read the magazine, you know, about they go, here's what the bad boy does and here's what the good boy does. <laughs> you know, and I, my first words were Billy bad boy about my brother. And you know, I kind of had a brother and a sister that were selfish and fighting. And, um, you know, I think I took on being a selfless personality, uh, you know, just, I don't know, it, it just makes sense. So um, as Charlie, uh, you know, tries to rationalize or question it or subvert it or, you know, denounce it or just question it, challenge it. Um, we need to be, it, it is a given, I guess, to answer Charlie, the, a good life, you know, is, um, you see it the way people turn out and you, you see it in 
his in the stories, you know, look, Scrooge and, you know, figures it out uh, in the end by kind of looking at his past, looking at the future. The philosophy of education is like philosophy and that we're all teachers in a way in our life. You just we keep teaching and the best the best um it, it sounded funny at first, but it makes sense. As an English teacher, you know, you want to read, write, listen, uh read, write, listen, and speak, you know, and but there's so much you really need to make sure that you're communicating and you're listening, you know, that it is a, a two-way street or a, um, I think oh, ideally yeah. like parents, you know, or like a teacher, like, a, you know, a t Jesus or Socrates or, you know, any of the, the best writers, Andy Anderson, <laughs> a lot of the people that, that are telling the truth right and and teaching what we need to do that that you begin to realize that's what man is you know that's what who we are and um you know we've got to we every generation for centuries has has faced you know should we let the the evil ones win <laughs> or will the good prevail and i've i've become this I read this James Perloff is a Christian deep state philosopher uh, and understander of history. And he's the one that said we have to be like, like saints. But he said before the church kind of rewrote the, I think the problem is the institutions. Right now there's no incentive for the church or the government or the businesses to be good. You know, we, we thought that was kind of baked into the common culture we have, but they, because they're kind of an invisible empire, they've given themselves, they say it's like the, um, like the invisible man in terms of communication theory. There's an invisible fascism, authoritarianism, Nazism, you know, that, that's there and, um, you know, if we still had the Federal Communication Commission and the Fairness Doctrine and honest service laws and all these these things that were put in to contain selfish abuse of power based on self by, by you know, bureaucrats or whoever these managers in the counter-revolution are, these authoritarians, these philosophical Luciferians who think it's good to be evil. This is the difference between Luciferians and Satanists is that they're kind of recruiting each other. They're recruiting the young people. And, you know, as, as our Luciferian who came here said that a study found that 50% of people now, you know, have been recruited like Charlie, apparently to being evil. You know, it, they think it's good to be evil. You know, there's no law against it. 
right? It's, um, you know, and so it's like a choice. Anyhow, I do hope y'all come back. If you want to, sorry, you can't stay longer and talk, but oh, come back thanks. next Good week. Well, wait okay. the fees tonight, by the way. Oh, yeah. Oh, you waived the fees tonight. Oh, he just gave it to Andy. Okay, yeah, okay. We'll wave them tonight. Oh, we waived it or, yeah. You want your money back? Or... <laughs> Thank you, okay. All right, so um, anyhow, it's, uh, I'm so glad that, that, he, that um, Bob talked about moral absolutes. I hadn't really realized that's what a moral, an absolute was. And um, I think Socrates talked about it, right? Did he, the, or the, Plato, Plato talked about it. Yeah, that, you'll have to give a talk on Plato because he's actually been given a bad name. Um, you know, yeah, Plato has been, people say, oh, he was a tyrant. And he wanted to be, you know, the philosopher king. I think, I think that's what they, that's a dirty trick because I mean, all I knew is what Socrates said and about the ideals and the ideal of justice and, um, you know, moral idealism is a good thing. And that, that's why I think Sir Cervantes wrote about this. And um, thank God that we just have to keep, we have to get our education system going again because otherwise the technocracy is going to dumb us down and kill us off with okay. the population control. Next rebutter, please. Yeah, you go ahead. You got five minutes, dude. All right. Fart knockers. Huh? Fart knockers. All right, uh, use the mic, Bill. Thanks for the nice speech. I wanted to use learn the mic. You can hear me? Not uh, the Where's his mic been? All right. So it was interesting to get some philosophy. We don't get that too often. I um, have a feeling America lost its way pretty much after 9-11 because we started doing these oil wars. And we were talking about good and evil and doing the right thing and knowing right from wrong and um, just solving a terrorist act with spending trillions of dollars on all these wars and making money for Halliburton and all the other military complex, industrial complex. That has been just terrible for the country and a lot of the population. And uh, the other thing is bailouts for billionaires. Uh, given all those trillions of dollars to, to the director, getting low. Also, these, um, you know, just giving tons and tons of money to the rich and to Wall Street. And, you know, having trillions of dollars of debt just to uh, take care of uh, companies. And that was wrong. Sorry, Obama. I, you know, I, I don't like Republicans nor Democrats, <laughs> so I'm right in the middle like everybody should be. Uh, boy, you really want to hear me yes. ramble? No. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just unfortunate that we've gone down these paths, and now it's just uh, dealing with fake news and bad information on the internets. Uh, and you know it's pr pretty uh, a recent uh, culture to uh, get all this bad news and misinformation and uh, uh, the control that now companies have learned how to control people on the internet and the information and the bad news and the uh, uh, so so on and so forth and it's you know a lot of people are just like on screens. TV, cable, internets, social medias, and, and that is so controlled now. And uh, it's just bad, bad, bad stuff for young and old alike and for the population. So I think that's the problem, the wars, the oil wars, the bailing out of billionaires, um, uh, the uh, the in, inner you know the information and internet not knowing right from wrong and uh, when Bob mentioned all these absolutes 
it was quite interesting and I'm thinking, well, America is not really following any of those anymore, it seems. And I think 25 years ago, before 9-11, uh, we were uh, on the right path as far as a uh, um, you know a quality country, but now it, it's now it's happy pig country. So um, uh, yeah, I mean there's some good lessons, I guess. And I, I got to agree with Charlie uh, that he uh, that it isn't a binary choice. It isn't just good or evil. It's somewhere in between. I try to do the right thing and no right from wrong. And uh, but there's a lot of criminals. Yeah. And unfortunately, there's a lot of white collar criminals, which I'm experiencing as many as, you know, actually uh, street criminals, but the street criminals end up in jail and then uh, the white collar ones. Uh, look at our ex-president. He's probably a big time criminal, but he'll probably get away with it and he'll probably be a president again. Uh, yeah, I think he's a convicted rapist, a convicted, um, uh, I don't know how many things he's been convicted of so far. I, I just hope there's a judge that throws him in jail for a year. I mean, uh, Illinois throws our governors in jail. What the hell? Did you throw Trump in jail for a year? Not if you want to live, right? Huh? Not if you don't want to be put in jail, I don't think I've done anything that bad. I haven't raped her. Well, somebody's got to grow a set of, uh, you know what, stumps. And they got to have some guts and, and throw them in jail for a year. And then he can't make do this election. Uh, so, you know, Trump doesn't know right from wrong, of course. Huh? He was a point of order. He said for office. Well, no, it was just we were talking about, huh? Okay, is it like the difference between right and wrong and ethical and moral behavior? And no, I won't talk about impeachment. We talked about so. Uh, but anyway. Um, you know, so I don't know. I didn't know Coyote that much in the novels and what he was about, but um, you know, you know what the heck? We're talking about him 500 years later, <laughs> Cervantes and Coyote. So he must have he must have been worthwhile. Um, and what else did I say wrong? American wars, American bailouts, American corporations, and and. Uh, I mean, we're, uh, you know, Biden's in another war. Biden's been in wars. So, yeah, we got, we have such a bad choice between people that don't know right from wrong. So we got the criminal Trump and then we got Biden who's a warmonger. You know, we're, we're, our tax dollars are going to bomb people in uh, yeah. Palestine. Palestine, I say it right? You know, I don't want my money going to that, you know. And then we the country is telling us what to do, Israel is telling us what to do. And it's all our money that's going to kill people. So Biden's just as stupid. So we got a bad choice of two president uh, contenders. Right, so kind of right and wrong and moral <laughs> immoral. And uh, am I, my five minutes over? Yes. You're just saying that. All right, let's get set up there next. You did good. Let's get set up. Andy approved. And the microphone is set. And the microphone is set. So just stay right there. You just stand it right to your set and you can go right ahead. How about that? That's good. Okay. Uh, the only thing, there's no such thing as absolute except one change. Things are perpetually changing. Let's look at some places like Ethiopia. Ethiopia, people think the way they walk, they were born like that. No. 
what happened was a white tribe came into the area and married a black tribe. So at that time in Africa, black skin was not considered inferior. It was considered inferior when the United States came into Africa and made slaves out of these people and taught people over a very long period of time that black skin means an inferior, an inferior individual. So that was change. And if you look, let's say, at, at somebody who was president that was black, Obama, people, if you ask somebody 50 years ago, there be a black president in the United States, they would say no. And it would be at least 80 to 100% would say no. And here he was, he was president. So that's change. And he just as intelligent as any white person. I didn't care for him. I thought he was just an opportunist, which he was. He was a social climber, just like Clinton was. So, and that's a, that extent. But we see, we saw a change anyway. If you walk down any street in any nation in the world ten years ago. And you walk down now, you'll see change. There's no such thing as a natural except change itself. And anything you could think of, whether it be an airplane, a railroad, a car, furniture, you name it. 50 years ago, it looked quite different than it is now. So everything is subject to change. There's no such thing as something not subject to change. All matter changes, whether we like it or not, because there's contradictions in everything that makes for change. If you see rocks, or if you see a mountain, after 10 years, They'll be changed because the rain hits it, the snow hits it, the wind hits it. So it's constant change. And people think of society, or they say capitalism. Capitalism has only been around maybe 500 years. Before that was feudalism. Before that, in some states, there was slavery. Before that, there was primitive communism in the tribes. So change is always going up. Black war, war horse, it always gets left out of the story. Blacks sold slaves to the Europeans. Yeah. So they captured them in prison. In prison right, now. right. Then they said, hey, you're getting on the boat because these are Europeans just bought all you Africans. Yeah. And that always gets left out of the store. So go back a little bit further and go, you know what? It was Africans that sold Africans as prisoners and slaves. You never hear that because American media is corrupt and it lies. It picks and selects. And that's history. Right, Charlie? Uh, if you try to keep the say the things the same, no matter how hard you try, it's never going to happen. The boat went with Africans to the Americas and the Caribbean. They picked up tobacco, sugar. They dropped so off the Africans. They picked up crap, tobacco, 
sugar, what have you, eat, whatever, put it in the boat, brought it back to Europe, yeah. unloaded it in Europe, the empty boats went back to Africa, said, hey, Mr. African Warlord, can you sell all your black people to us? And they threw them in the boat. That always gets left out of the equation. No, so white people went over to Africa and captured like No, that ain't what happened. They bought them from their own people. <coughs> the no, blacks no, no, no. are what okay. well, it says to them. Even if you take corporations, at one time, we did have corporations um, when the United States first started. Like, I think it was uh, tea companies were corporations, but they were only corporations for a period of time, and then they had to give it up. But now everything is corporation. Are you saying corporations bought the black, the slaves? Huh? Well, Plantation owner. I think it was the tea company. What was it called? Are we on topic? Um, when they threw the tea overboard, um, the tea company was a corporation, but I don't remember the name of the corporation. Probably somebody was. Well, yeah, I had a pr problem with you talking about white people all the way up. That is not true. That's and then you had the Timbuktu, which is more or less highly developed. So it wasn't all like primitive people. Black selling black. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody online want to give a rebuttal or not? Because I'm going to do mine now. Oh boy, we're going to hear about thorium or no. about businesses. You know, the funny thing about it is, is that there was a guy, let me get this back on myself here real quick. Got to get Bail, the... Uh, bailouts are good. Green is good. Oh, bailouts yeah. for the billionaires is good. <laughs> you can learn a lot from a good old reading of scripture. Well, there we go. Nasty's not chapter one. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors of which they toil and under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the north and blows to the south. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear fill of hearing. What has been will be again, what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the four former generations, or even those to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. And of course, he goes on and on and on about how he derived meaning from his life. And uh, Solomon went on to do things like great projects, Maybe have a he had some seven hundred women uh, that he had relations with, Whoa. but in the end, he said, not only was the teacher wise, but it was also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and sent in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like codes; they're collected sayings like firmly embossed nails. Given by one shepherd, he warned. He warned my son in anything in addition to him. He then concludes, of the making of many books, there is no end. And much study wearies the body. Now that all has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter. 
fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind, for God will bring every good deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it be good or evil. So what's the meaning of life? Fear God and keep his commandments. Who's next? I've, I've uh, accepted Jesus as my Savior. Let's go from here. In Wisconsin. <laughs> All right, Charlie, you're up. Five All minutes. right, uh, I don't have to go that long, but I'd like to thank Bob for a nice overview of a very complex topic of philosophy, of basically ethics. I can find my remarks to three certain areas. I don't believe that there is a structure imposed on the universe that is, as I said earlier, a binary system of good and evil. Uh, I don't think that's the way nature exists. Nature, there's a position of neutrality uh, and there's a certain uh, neutrality towards the activities that take place in nature. Uh, I don't think there's conscious decisions uh, that uh, of conduct, which is what it's called. Now, oddly enough, the speaker chose a book, uh, Don Quixote. Don Quixote chose an occupation of a soldier, a knight. is a unique kind of soldier in the sense that he ascribed to a code, code of chivalry in which, oddly enough, a soldier does evil things, he inflicts harm on others, yet ostensibly this is for a positive, very good purpose. Uh, there's somewhat of an internal contradiction there. When is he conducting, he does evil to do good. Ostensibly, ultimately, the aim is to do good, but if his process he has chosen is a harmful one. Now, the other thing is, I see on the second page of the handout, there's some talk there of a code. A code, a code is a another key team keyword for commandment. And I can see the author here is giving us, amazingly enough, his version of the Ten Commandments. Now. As I said, all human conduct has a certain measure of neutrality to it. Um, also, I do not know, in the course of nature, underlying all discussion of ethics, um, are certain things such as the moral calculus and assessment of the conduct. Um, also, there's another thing that they call deontology. You have duty to do this impose. This is where it comes to do good and avoid evil. You somehow, but I'm not aware of any sort of mechanism that monitors it or imposes a duty upon us in one, one fashion or another. I don't see the evidence of that. Is that something we possibly should do? Is that advice? Uh, it is, but also, I'm not certain uh, if you have authority, Bob, to write your own set of commandments. Uh, apparently, you don't like the ones given to us in Scripture, so you decided to compose your own. They look pretty good to me uh, on the surface, but as I say, any kind of code like this uh, is, 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 is nothing but a list of commandments. All right, thank you. Rules. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Andy, go ahead when you're ready. Oh, one last thing. Now, you guys conspire. These conspiracy theorists all feel that there is a dark evil force in the universe. Now, and it manifests itself, I guess, selectively on events. And underlying it, nothing, it's very difficult to be a conspiracy theorist because nothing is as it appears to be. It, there's a great deception to the universe, but um, there is an underlying uh, darkness that underlies is the, the factor that precipitates all events in the universe. 
if that's your basic premise, uh, I guess pursue it if you wish. Anyhow, thank you. Okay, Andy, go next, and then Janice will get to you after Andy. Okay, uh, go ahead, Andy, yeah. and then we'll get Janice from online. Thanks, Bob, for a, a good talk on uh, ethics and morality and what we should be doing. I, I was raised with the concept of character is what you are in the dark when nobody's looking. You know, and a lot of people can uh, try to be good characters and friendly and things when, when people are watching, but what is it like when nobody's looking? <clears throat> There's a universal moral imperative among all people. Uh, basically, you, you know, the universal, the universal imperative among all people and a lot of animals, too, uh, to protect the young. In, in humans, there's universal hate, hatred for anybody that abuses children. Child mm -hmm. abusers, pedophiles don't last long in prison when they get convicted and sent away. That's one thing we have in common, uh, a moral imperative to protect kids. Somebody mentioned that we got Obama after Bush Cheney. Many people weren't really voting for a black man or voting for Obama. They would have voted for Donald Trump or Daffy the Duck to get in place of Bush Cheney, the eight years of crime. Well, it turned out that Obama and his vice president <clears throat> gave us eight more years of Bush Cheney crimes. And Obama was a placeholder between Republican criminals. Uh, as criminals masquerading as Republicans. We got a talk here coming up that says America needs to elect a Republican because the Democrats are bad. Well, I agree with that in one respect. We need a Republican like Dwight D. Eisenhower that believed in universal education, you know, affordable health care. Dwight Eisenhower was a Republican. He, he believed in things that are espoused by Bernie Sanders today. And Bernie gets all kinds of flack for being, uh, say, well, I think it's Texas that recently passed a law uh, removing 2 million kids from Medicaid. The, the message is we can't give these people food and medicine, the, the billionaires. We need more money for the billionaires. Who cares how many people starve and die? No other country, no other modern country in the world is permitting that bullshit. It's just, that's the essence of evil. Jim Hightower published a book in 2003 called Thieves in High Places. He listed all three pages of bills that Bush Cheney passed in just two years. He said, wade into that mess. Put on a gas mask and gloves and wade into that. Look at those bills. See if you can find anything in there that isn't the essence of Antichrist. And then step back and ask yourselves, how come there's so many sexual scandals in the Republican Party? Well, look at that list of legislation. To pass bills like that, you need perverts. You need people with no, no ethics, no morals, no conscience. People like Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin is my hero today. Actions speak louder than words. Joe is out there telling us to the billionaires, you give me enough money, I'll do evil shit for you. And Joe Manchin is demonstrating what a person with no ethics, no morals, and conscience as an intellectual prostitute, how you function smoothly taking money from billionaire predator pimps. That's what we got. These aren't campaign campaign contributions. These billionaires own and operate a stable of intellectual prostitute criminals in human form, masquerading as our elected officials. If we don't deal with it, there, are, there will be no free speech colleges like this after November 7th this year. Talking like this, criticizing our great leaders will be grounds for arrest and disappearance. And they've already gotten the agenda written. Everything changes, somebody said. Well, change is coming. We're heading toward a cliff. Uh, on one way, we have a clean, decent, green future, a livable planet. If enough people take a hit for the team, start spending your time and money to influence climate change and cut down total fossil fuel use. We get what we pay for. If people don't want to pay for change, 
with their time or money or whatever they can afford, then we won't get any. The other, there's two pathways into the future. One of them has a basically livable planet like what we have now. The other one by 2087, 2080, you know, uh, but roughly 10 years, they're estimating 10 years before the turn of the century, we get 190 feet of sea level rise flooding all coastal cities on the planet. Kids born today, before scarcely before they're 50, they're going to be looking at what Manhattan and Miami look like before they went underwater. Like we look at pictures of where they think the lost city of Atlantis is with some of these stone. There's, there's cities that are trapping cities under the ocean now, tracking them that are 100 feet down. That they, you know, we got good sonar and uh, deep, uh, yeah, deep submersibles that can uh, find ruins on the bottom. That, they, they couldn't even do that 10 years ago. Our, our Navy uh, outlined uh, the sonar uh, back 25 years ago. They outlined a, the outline of a city off the coast of Cuba that's over 100 feet down in the water. We had civilizations were on this planet, you know, tens of thousands of years ago before the sea level rose. Um, one of the things... One of the things that I give credibility to people, if somebody is a whistleblower, if, if a whistle in, in America, a whistleblower used to be rewarded. You know, Daniel Ellsberg uh, was famous for leaking the Pentagon papers, and they they didn't. He, he, I don't think he finally went to jail, did he? Anybody know if Daniel Ellsberg went to jail? I don't, I didn't think so, but uh, they want today. Obama prosecuted more whistleblowers and sent them to jail than any prior president, all of them combined. And he was supposedly a liberal Democrat. Today, if you tell the truth, if, if you know the insider story on things, you risk a jail sentence. That's how far America has gone toward total fascism. So, uh, one for those of you that haven't been logging on to it, uh, as of today, as of today, updated February 20th, the Want to Know Info site. Charlie, this will be an information. Uh, Charlie, this might be something interesting to you. The Want to Know Info site is they're revamping their UFO center. They're releasing, they're, they're giving a summary of all the videos that uh, military has been involved in all over the world interacting with other civilizations. We're not alone. We haven't been alone for a while. It's kind of an updated version of Jim Mars' book from 1997, Alien Agenda. He said, this is not a book about aliens. Aliens are here. They're all over the place. Get used to it. Are you guys doing okay back there? Is anybody uh, listening or am I just talking to the camera? You're, 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 I'm here again. You don't have to, you don't have to follow the law. He I, I was just hoping that somebody in the room would be listening. Okay. <laughs> but at um, any rate, I want, I want final note. The recent reports that came out this last week, uh, the, the, the climate, new climate reports come out from somewhere every week, and they're, they're talking about the North Pole basically being ice-free by 2030. And that is no, not a, no ice remelting, just dark water. And they're talking about uh, in the next year or two or three, if something isn't done, if it keeps getting worse, the Gulf Stream that brings water around and up toward Great Britain, the Gulf Stream could slow down or stop. That it's a, like a conveyor belt of warm water, and we would have massive climate changes in both you know America and Europe. And this this is happening now, and and people are talking about uh, 40 or 50 years from now we don't have to do anything until then. Well. Log on to the Want to Know Info site. That's Want to Know and check out their archives. They also, they have huge archives on uh, the Jeffrey Epstein affair and all of our politicians that have been bribed and done evil shit because they, uh, Epstein and the Israelis had videotapes of a lot of our politicians on the sex, drugs, rock and roll, one week vacation in Israel. That's been going on for years. So, uh, We've had pedophile rings serving the highest ranking politicians in this country right up to the top of the White House since the Reagan administration. Epstein wasn't the first. The, uh, the Franklin scandal with uh, Franklin and uh, the, uh, 
with the Franklin scandal was savings and loan 1988, but uh, Larry King, the man that ran that, was running a pedophile ring out of Boys Town. He was uh, running flights with young boys and girls into the Bush, into the Reagan Bush White House, and servicing politicians in Washington. We've had, that's how deep the corruption goes, and it's being exposed. It's finally being exposed. But the last thing I'll say is, now it spreads right here from person to person. What we're talking about in some of these things is not in the news. It's not on radio, TV. We're buried in a sea of propaganda by mainstream media 24-7. And to answer Charlie, uh, in 1929, the, tobacco, the, uh, the asbestos industry developed um, a policy to keep the hazards of asbestos away from the American people. They would seal law. If anybody's got a lawsuit, they would seal the files, pay off the claim, and claim they never heard of it. And that 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 policy ran right up until 1964, when the Surgeon General declared that we asbestos is a massive health hazard. But before then, they used asbestos all through World War II. A lot of guys working with it, doing brake jobs, pipelinings. Nobody knew. I mean, they weren't. The workers weren't told. Maybe uh, the, the lawyers that handled the cases they knew about it, but they were sealing files. So. Uh, now the beneficial knowledge is there on certain websites that tell the truth. Incidentally, if you, there's a last thing I'll say, there's a website, look it up. There's 270 Americans listed. It's called Americans Who Tell the Truth. People that uh, like whistleblowers, people, like people okay. that, people that uh, work their whole life, they risk bankruptcy, they risk jail, uh, the fence jumpers that protested nuclear power. What, you, know, you can tell it's, if it's credible, that people are risking their lives and their health and their, their money and their employment to tell the truth on something. If they have nothing to gain and everything to lose, that's how you tell somebody has credibility. All right. Okay, Janice, you want Thank to- Thank you. Janice, you're next. Thank you. Um, tell yourself, please. Um, I've been writing in the chat uh, about an issue about which I am passionate, and that is democracy which somebody mentioned that they were passionate about, and the earth, which I mentioned. Um, next week, uh, the Cook County Board. Now, do you know who is your Cook County Commissioner? If not, look up the person on your favorite browser. Is that it, Janice? Um, uh, but next week, the Cook County Board will vote on an, ordin on an ordinance uh, to uh, ban toxic coal car driveway sealants. So uh, we want you to be willing to contact your commissioner and ask that person to support the ordinance to ban coal car driveway sealants. Coal tar. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? What is that? Go ahead, David. All right. Coal tar driveway sealants. Next thing you know, we'll be happy. We'll be like San Francisco. Expensive beyond belief. That's why truckers aren't going into New York anymore. What Andy said about Dwight Eisenhower was true. Shortly after he became president, he sat down at the White House for a meeting with, with, the, with the, key leaders, the key leaders of the new Republican Congress. The new Speaker of the House, uh, Joseph Martin, the new Senate Majority Leader, Robert Taft, and others. And they said, now we're going to roll back the New Deal. And President Eisenhower said that this was not the case. That he, well, he wasn't going to start any new social programs, but he wasn't going to take away from the people what they had already been given. And the president went on to tell these folks that if we want to be a, the majority party instead of a minority party, then Republicans have got to stop acting like it's still 1860 and live in the modern world with everybody else. And at a subsequent meeting, the same, uh, the same people present, the president told them that the Republican Party, in order to be successful, needed three things, unemployment insurance, Social Security and a farm program. That's something that the Republican Party still hasn't figured out. 
You're welcome. All right. Anybody else? All right. Uh, Robert Lichtenberg, you get the last word. All right. While he's coming up, anybody else? Yeah. Isn't it in the streets too? Yeah. Did you see about the screening? Security. Oh, it's, While we're waiting for Bob Lichtenberg, first it's coal tar dry place, next it's plastic bags, next it's something else. We'll be an overregulated society and uh, be just like San Francisco, where everything costs four times as much due to excessive regulation. Mm -hmm. All right. Switch corruption. Okay, thanks for your comments <clears throat> and rebuttals, <clears throat> even though a lot of them weren't on the topic. Um, Alan started out with a very good point that the institutions today that are failing us uh, to transmit values, transmit any, anything we feel passionate about. You won't find that in any institution in our society today. And we need it, especially, yeah, we need it. And education fails the most. Um, <clears throat> the next, Mike said, we don't follow absolutes. It's true, because we don't know them. We're not taught them. We're not conscious of them. Absolutes. <clears throat> we're, we're, very few people have any awareness of them. And that's why we can't follow them. But they're not that hard. If we only cared about them, we could bring them to more widely attention and bring your, <clears throat> bring um, bring uh, absolutes into more everyday use. Um, <clears throat> whether the universe is binary, no, not in the sense that many things are both good and evil. I have a mixture. Matter of fact, everything has that has meaning and meaningless anything. Um, so the world isn't binary in that sense. Um, and then Sid's point about the only change is, uh, the only absolute is change itself, but that's, that's on the physical level. That's on the material level. Um, there might be some absolutes there. I, I didn't look into that. Um, but absolutes exist, plenty of them on the... Um, Immaterial level or the intangible level. And a lot of, I had a lot of visuals of that, but they didn't get shown. Um, I didn't really discuss them. I can't discuss that level because it's much too complicated. Maybe someday I might think of a way to make that simple enough to present here. It's a very complex question, though. <clears throat> the uh, Material and the immaterial, is there an immaterial realm? Now that's what all philosophy is about, the immaterial realm. What, what philosophy can you do for the material realm? Maybe a little Marxism in the bad sense, <laughs> not the good sense. So, um, so that's a difficult question, very difficult. And we still don't agree since 1979. <laughs> we, have, we haven't changed. Well, uh, I guess most people don't. Charlie doesn't like the fact that Don Quixote was a soldier and carried a sword. He did, but he wasn't in the military. He used a sword to help others, usually females in distress, and rescue them, as I said, from rapists. So, um, so he wasn't really a soldier in the sense that he was in the military. It was not in the military. Yeah, I think it was Don Um, <clears throat> and Charlie said I came up with a list of my own commandments, and he liked them, and I appreciate that, of course. But um, they're not really commandments. I didn't give any commandments today. Just a bunch of absolutes, nine of them. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And Andy concluded with the universal moral commandment, care for our kids, which all societies 
do practice. Um, one society I had in my hand out there, the Eskimos, in the movie, The Nook of the North, showed how the Eskimos would put their parents on ice floes when, once they hit the age 60, because they would decline after that in that very hostile environment. So they put them on ice floes to die. And in effect, they're killing their own parents. They're not murdering them, they're killing them. I don't know of any cases of anyone killing children. The Israelis are killing them. Who? The Israelis are killing Palestinians. Well, that's very different. Very different. Oh, well, that's all I have. Thank you very much again for coming. I appreciate it very much. Go Rambler. It's great. You're a Rambler, right? A, a Rambler? Me? No, I don't believe in sticking on the point, sticking to the point. But the college campus is a great place. I'm glad Charlie and Tim helped us survive for many years. And um, it's great to get together every week, discuss ideas. You won't find that in too many places. And it's a great thing. It's diminished. I hope I can get back. I put out a plea to get my friends to get the old gang back. I don't think any of them came except Ellen. <laughs> so I'm going to have with my seekers on life lessons and novels. If anyone would like to join the Seekers, see me. It'll be at my house. It'll be free pizza and pop. You know, because I appreciate my friends coming and talking. So uh, thanks again, once again. Good night. Take it you but take it. All right, Bob. Thank you very much. You have a good night, sir. And let's give our speaker one more rousing round of applause for coming in and putting up with this peanut gallery tonight. And uh, at this point, I will consider the College of Complexes adjourned. We'll see you next week. We got an upcoming list of a lot of exciting speakers coming up tonight. Uh, I appreciate all you guys coming in tonight, Kelvin, Mike, and uh, Joseph, and Veronica, and Janice, and Margaret and uh, Kelvin. So thank you all for coming. And uh, again, I wish all of you a good night and we'll see you next week.